Hi, I'm Todd Austin. I'm a professor at University of Michigan and also currently on partial leave to Edge to Labs, which is a data security startup. Today, I'm going to talk about microarchitectural side channel attacks. What are the risks of these side channel attacks? Why is it that the way we design systems leads to side channel attacks? And then we'll get into the specifics of a variety of an entire taxonomy of these side channel attacks. And I'll talk about some of my philosophies on how we can protect ourselves from them, which is very challenging. All right, let's get started. Um, here's the outline of the course. We're gonna be talking about first, just a general overview of what are security attacks in general. Why are they bad? Why do we need to fix them? And then we are going to uh, spend some time talking specifically about what are side channel attacks. And then we're going to go through a taxonomy of side channel attacks from control based. These are attacks that uh, infer what the program is executing. Uh, memory side channel attacks, micro architectural state side channel attacks and then uh, physical measurement side channel attacks. And at the end, I'll give some of the key takeaways from this presentation today. And then we'll also talk a little bit about what are the defense strategies for side channel attacks. All right, so let's, let's take a look at security attacks in general. Um, you know, security isn't very secure today for really two reasons. One is, uh, loads and loads of vulnerabilities in software, and we just don't have the mechanisms, either human or formal mathematic mechanisms to find and fix all the bugs that lead to security problems in the software we have today. So it's pretty much the case that all software is hackable, every bit of it. And so you can see this chart, this is from IBM X-Force Red. This is a red teaming infrastructure inside IBM. And you can see that over time, the number of vulnerabilities continue to grow. But if you look at the, uh, the bar, uh, the shaded, the shaded uh, contour, you can see that even the rate of growth of vulnerabilities is growing, even though we're spending so much effort in the security industry to try to stop security breaches. It's, it's really uh, it's quite stunning how poorly we're doing at the uh, providing good data security in our industry. Um, I'll just also say that, you know, there's a lot of talk in the community about zero trust. Zero trust is really this belief that all software is hackable all the time. It really is. It, it's, and, and, and because you embrace that belief, you really take a different approach on security. It's one I absolutely embrace. The second problem with security day is side channels. There are so many side channels, and that's really the focus of this presentation today. What a side channel is an observable property of the system that reveals something secret that is going on inside of it. It's a way to extract information from a system. You know, the, the classic uh, safe cracking using a stethoscope is an audio side channel. In terms of computers, we typically look at timing or power as observable side effects that infer, can allow us to infer information about the internals. And they're really on the rise, especially since Spectre and Meltdown a few years ago, which were two very sort of severe um, uh, side channel attacks. So we'll talk a little bit later in this, in this presentation. And, you know, the approach we take in security today is, is one of using, what, you know, patching design fixes to try and improve our design because we don't have the machinery really yet to find and fix all of our bugs in advance. We really let the finding of the vulnerabilities and bugs, that's in the hands of the attackers. And then we respond. So we develop our systems, we try to make them secure, we deploy those systems and they get attacked. Our customers get upset and then we try to figure out how they got attacked. We deploy countermeasures and the system is safer in the end. And then we redeploy and the process continues. They call this the security arms race and it's tough to get out of the security arms race. You've got to really gravitate towards durable security mechanisms to try and alleviate this continual rat race of find a vulnerability, fix a vulnerability, find out a new vulnerability, fix a vulnerability. 
and it's really it's tough to escape because there's really this asymmetry between the power of attackers and the power of protectors. As protectors, we have to find every single vulnerability in the system and lock it down tight. That is difficult. In fact, knowing that there's no vulnerabilities left is a proof that something doesn't exist. And that's very, very difficult. The attackers, on the other hand, they just have to find one vulnerability. And they don't even have to find it sometimes. Sometimes they learn about it on forums and they get scripts to get access to it. So you know, it doesn't even take much talent to, uh, to take part in an attack. You just need to have access to the proper information. As a result, you know, it's just more work to protect than it is to attack, significantly more work. This, uh, this graph, very interesting graph. It was a study by DARPA uh, a while ago where they, they looked at the growth of rate of code in protection systems, security protection systems, things like antivirus and network flight recorders, et cetera, et cetera, over time. And the growth was roughly two X lines of code every uh, two years, okay? So, you know, exponential growth in the complexity of protection systems. Then they looked at the growth of malware over these same 30 years. And they found that uh, malware had grown 1.4x in 30 years. The complexity grew 1.4x in 30 years, which basically means that it's not much more complex to attack a system today than it was 30 years ago. But protecting a system today is significantly more complicated than it was 30 years ago. And uh, yeah, spoiler alert, it's still not doing very well. So let's take a look at side channel attacks specifically. We're not going to study the software-based attacks. We can, we can do that at another time. Today, we're really going to focus on side channel attacks. And these really are sort of the bread and butter of hardware designers and circuit designers. A side channel attack is, is just when an information leaks secrets through observable properties. And clever attackers can utilize that leaked information to reconstitute information about the secrets. Sometimes they can't fully reconstitute, reconstitute the secret information. Sometimes they, they just have statistical properties of the information they're trying to find, but it certainly cuts down on the task of figuring out what are the secrets inside the system. And there's just lots of observable properties of the system that leads to many, many attacks. We can look at the power draw of the system. That tells us what kind of computation it's doing. We can look at the timing of the operations of the system. It tells us what the system is doing, what it's executing or not executing. We can look at the electromagnetics of the system. We're not gonna cover this today, but this one is really, really information rich. Um, there's lots of demonstrations of just single encryptions revealing all the key information. Um, we can do what are called fault-based attacks. We can inject faults into the circuit operations, which cause cryptographic operations to fail, and that reveals information. We'll see an example of that today. And then finally, the other side channel we got to consider is the people in our system, right? If I give money to someone to give me their password, I have what's called a social attack on my system, and, uh, and you know, I'm coming in through the side using bribery examples. So there's lots of different side channel attacks we need to be aware of. In the context of hardware designers and system designers, these, this is what, this is my taxonomy of side channels. And they're really kind of from top to bottom, where bottom you have things that are more circuit oriented and top you have things that are more application oriented. And then every, all the layers of the system in between. So let's start at the top and then work our way down to the things we're really going to focus on in this in this uh, in this forum talk today. At the very top, at the application level, if you're using cryptography in your application, um, there's a side channel possibility on the ciphertext, the encrypted text that the application produces, and that's called a cryptanalytic side channel. And so attackers may try to analyze your crypto to try and learn what it is that you're, 
saving in your cryptography. A great example of crypto analytics side channel are the cryptograms from the newspaper. You've ever seen these puzzles in the newspaper? You know, where you look, oh, a single letter here, that must be an A, because in English, a single letter word is A. Three letter word could be a the, T-H-E. And then you start correlating the letters and eventually you figure out the whole sentence. That's exactly cryptanalysis. Crypt analysis of human readable text. We do the same thing in computers. Uh, the second side channel we need to worry about are control side channels. These are side channels that occur when branches in the program, loops or if statements, make decisions on secrets. And those decisions vary the amount of time the program executes or changes how the program accesses its instruction memory. Attackers, if they can infer that those decisions were made a particular way, they learn something about the internal uh, secrets of the program. And we're gonna see a bunch of examples of this today. The next layer are the memory side channels. If secrets in the program determine how memory is accessed, then by competing in the cache, or looking at bus transactions, we can infer information about how memory was accessed, and we can then infer information about the secrets that led to those memory accesses. I'll see a bunch of examples of those today. Microarchitecture state cha side channels are when the internal underlying unarchitected state of the microarchitecture, the branch target buffers, the load buffers, et cetera, hold information and they affect the timing of the microarchitectural operations. A clever attacker can manipulate that state to leak information out of the system or infer what a program is doing as it runs, uh, either through competition or by just looking at the latency of the program. We'll see some examples of this today. And then physical side channels, more of a circuit level phenomena where we look at electrical power, voltage you know variations and you know em electromagnetic emanations and we refer information about what is the computation at the circuit level and it's a very powerful side channel uh one that you know again difficult to stop we'll see an example of that so let's let's dive into that but before we do let's just take a moment to look at why side channels arise you know, it's partly because designers don't understand about side channels, right? Go, go back to your business and just walk the halls and ask people, what's a side channel? How can you create a side channel? You know, chances are they don't know about it because, you know, and when you're an electrical engineer, you don't take security classes, but it's the electrical engineers designing systems that leads to these side channels. But even worse, it's really the way we design systems that lead to side channels. There's three things you can do to a system to create a side channel. It just so happens those are the three things you do to a system to make them really efficient. First, you want resource sharing. Resource sharing is necessary for a side channel. Well, it's not complete necessary for all side channels, but it's desirable because it creates contention between a victim and an attacker. And that contention reveals what the victim is doing. You wanna know if someone's touching an iCache line? Displace their iCache line and see if they put it back there. That resource sharing, not only does it provide good use of transistors and makes our systems more efficient, it also creates a side channel. The second thing is optimizing the common case. Optimizing the common case means you can tell when you're using the common case and when you're not using the common case, which leaks information out to the system. I can tell when you're doing ads. I can tell when you're doing multiplies because multiplies are a lot longer latency than ads. So by optimizing the common case to make the system fast, we are also leaking information about whether we're doing the common operations or not. So huge tension between performance-oriented design and side channel free design. And then finally, in order to really utilize side channels, you need high precision timing mechanisms. You need visibility into what the system is doing. In order to write highly efficient programs, you need high precision timing mechanisms and visibility into what the system's doing. So just again and again and again, we see these tensions between high performance design and side channel creation. So we can escape those tensions 
and have high performance designs without side channels, but we need to understand how side channels are created. We need to eliminate those side channels. So let's take a look at our first class of side channels, the control based side channel. These are side channels that are created when our programs make decisions on secrets. And I'm going to look at one of the classic attack, Coacher's RSA attack. The kernel of RSA, what is RSA? It's, it's, it's an asymmetric uh, cryptographic algorithm, very, very popular. It's not post-quantum safe, but it's still very popular used everywhere uh, today. And it requires the exponentiation of very large numbers. And when you do exponentiation of very large numbers, you basically, uh, the number you're ex that you're taking to the power of, you look at the bits of that number. And if the bit is a zero, then you just square the result. And when the bit is a one, you multiply and square. So it's, it's called the multiply square algorithm. And the, the, the number we're taking the power to here is the secret key of the system. So this, uh, this X here, which is pulling bit K out, is uh, this bit K here is a secret bit from the key. And you can see K determines if K is one, then we do a multiply. And if K is zero, excuse me, if K is one, we do a multiply followed by a square. And if K is, is zero, we do just a square. So the one bit in the key leads to an additional multiply. If you can sense that that multiply is occurring, you can infer whether the bit of the key was a one or a zero. Now there's a couple different ways to do that here. You can uh, either time the operation, right? So uh, this, 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 uh, when the, the bit is zero, there is no multiply, which takes essentially you know, zero time. And when the bit is one, it takes a multiply, which takes a while to compute, a couple cycles. So if you can feel those couple cycles happening during that time, uh, you can sense that. You can also look for power, EM emanations. You can look at the cache line. If these two lines of code are in different cache lines, you can infer information um, in that way. So there's lots of sensors we can use to do that. Um, in this particular attack, they're looking at each iteration of the loop and trying to time how long it takes the loop to execute. Um, they make a prediction about uh, uh, information about the key, and by controlling the information that it is encrypting, uh, they make predictions about how long it should take based on the key. And then they continue to refine those predictions, learning more and more bits of the key. So Kocher's attack is really using timing as a sensor, but as we get later in this talk, I'm going to reuse this example again and again. There's lots of different ways we can uh, instrument this code and, and find out this information. Um, so just a brief word about these control, the way you eliminate control attacks is you can't make if decisions and loop termination decisions on secrets. So for example, when you look at the RSA algorithm, the RSA algorithm, excuse me, the AES algorithm, the AES algorithm is specifically designed to not make any control decisions on secrets in there. So this is the way you eliminate this, probably the most durable way you eliminate this is just rewrite the code. Now, what if you need to make a decision on a piece of code? You can use, for example, predication or a conditional move, for example. So there are ways to sort of eliminate this particular kind of code-based uh, side channel. Now let's take a look at memory side channels. Now with memory side channels, we're gonna observe how a victim accesses memory. And if the accesses to memory are based on any secrets in the program, through resource sharing and looking at uh, the common case of hitting or not hitting in the cache, we can very uh, quickly learn whether or not, um, we can very much, very quickly learn how this victim is accessing its memory and learn information about its secrets. And it's kind of a classic attack here is a, is a cache-based side channel attack. Um, algorithms like AES, when they do encryption, they, access what's called the key table based on information in the key bits. And so by simply creating contention in the cache, in the data cache this time, it's possible for a victim running on the same system sharing the same cache to know what cache lines were touched by the other application, which in this case would be an encryptor, an AES encryptor. And again, you see these, these things. We've got resource sharing. 
to the victim and the and the uh, uh, the attacker are both using the same cache. Uh, we have optimization features make the common case fast. So whenever the victim touches a piece of storage, it goes into its top level cache. And we also have high precision counters, for example, the time timestamp counter on x86, for example, to do high precision measurements so we can know if the victim is, is getting cache misses or not. So let's take a look at one of these particular attacks. This attack is called Prime Press Probe. Uh, had a huge impact on the industry, leading to essentially no sharing of memory between VMs in the cloud today because you could apply this attack in the last level cache. Um, what it does is it, it tries to create eviction sets in the attacker. What is an eviction set? An eviction set is when we access the cache and we fill one set of the cache with all of my data, I'm the attacker, right? So I prime, that's called priming the cache. And when my data is in the cache, I know that when I access it, it'll be fast. So I can access my own data and know that it's fast. Then what I do is I make a call into another virtual, you know, another VM, and it's some kind of cryptographic operation. And I happen to know that the cryptographic operations in that other VM, you know, based on some secret, will touch some of this information that I've primed in the cache. So I make that call to that victim. It accesses, and based on a secret, it throws out some of the lines of my cache. Then when it comes back to me to give my result, maybe the encrypted value, I then access my cache again, figure out what parts of that data is now slow, which I can do. I'm just accessing my own code or data, and I'm timing it. And the stuff that's slow indicates what the other application did. And so now by sharing the code, I now can infer what's happening. The reason why this really led to deduplication of code in VMs is because the attack was being done on the last level cache uh, between VMs that were sharing code, for example, um, dynamically linked libraries of uh, you know cryptographic libraries like OpenSSL. And so now when I called into that other library, I could see how you were executing code based on whether or not it was in our, our shared cache because we were sharing this code. Why did we want to share that code? So we didn't have to have so much code in memory at the same time. And today now they, they do deduplication and use a lot more of the memory resources because they don't want this kind of attack to work. Let's take a look again at our, our square and multiply algorithm. We can definitely do this attack on square and multiply. If we're both sharing that code, right? Which we want to do if we want to reduce the amount of code that's in memory. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a system library. Why do we have to have two copies in memory? Um, then when the, when the I'll, I'll access the code and I'll make sure that everything uh, is in memory. You know, one line's in memory, one's not, for example. And then I'll make a code into, I'll make a call into the other VM and I can see uh, what, which of one of those lines displaced my memory. I put something else there and I can see which one of those lines that that victim executed. Now I can tell whether or not there was a, a one or zero in that particular bit. And uh, if I'm really fast, I can actually see multiple bits in a single run. Really, uh, really impressive way to infer information about another program. You know, the key defense here is stop deduplication. So we're not sharing any information. So I can't infer what you're doing. But even then, when I'm not sharing other information, if I still know the addresses you're going to touch, then I can still uh, infer whether or not you were executing, you know, part of a new statement or not. So in that case, what we want to do is we really want to, um, we want to break the dependence on me knowing what addresses you have. So we'll use things like address space layout randomization, ASLR, and other uh, address randomization techniques. Uh, okay, let's dive into uh, more into microarchitectural side channels. These are side channels formed in microarchitectural state that isn't even defined in the architecture manual. This is in the branch predictors and the branch target buffers and the load buffers, things that the microarchitects put in there that aren't even the concern of programmers, but yet they are now leaking information into uh, outside the world. 
And the reason why they're leaking information is because the attackers know about the state and they can manipulate this shared state, which optimizes the common case, right? So back to the, our, you know, back to our, our original two issues there. Let's take a look at jump over ASLR. This is a really famous attack um, that uh, really led to sort of a really a, 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 a huge growth in the amount of microarchitectural attacks. It's a BTB priming attack. What's a BTB? The BTB is the branch target buffer. When the front end of the microarchitecture makes a branch prediction, it needs to know where is the target of that branch prediction. And it puts some bits of that target enough to index the cache into the BDB. Okay. And so if you've made a jump before, when you do that jump in the future, that jump is really fast. You don't have to compute the target. It's just sitting there in the BTB. So that you've optimized the case of jumps that you take often. And so what the attacker is going to do is it's going to try to infer if another program is making a particular jump. Now, why would you want to do that? Remember in our case of the square multiply, if a program is making a particular jump, it's revealing information about the secrets that it's executing if those jumps are based on a secret. So what I can do is I can, I can have my victim, you know, do some processing on a secret that I care about, and that will load up the BTB to optimize for its particular jumps. And then I, as the spy on the same microarchitecture, can try to make those same jumps. They're not the same addresses, they're in my address space, but there's no address space information in the BTBs. Uh, spoiler alert, they don't care because BTBs don't have to be correct. They don't store, they store partial tags with no address space information. Why? Because if the BTB is wrong, the microarchitecture will fix it. But as a spy, I can learn if the victim was optimized on a certain decision path. And that will tell me information when I execute my code, whether or not the victim had 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 made a particular decision and it got into the BTB. If it's a hit, I know the branch went one way. If it's a miss because I that it, it isn't optimized, then I know that you know the decision was another direction. And this attack really then led to Spectre and Meltdown. You probably heard about this attack. Let's take a look at how this works, which is also a priming-based attack. It's an attack that, that that does a lot of priming in the in the microarchitecture. Uh, in this case, the priming is in the uh, it's in the branch predictor. Uh, let's look at meltdown first, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, Spectre. The basic idea is that we want to execute some misspeculation code. What what is speculation? Speculation is when you do branch prediction or address prediction. And you, uh, you, you execute some code before you know the branch that controls that code, what its outcome is, okay? And in that case, um, you may have to throw away some computation. The goal of Spectre and Meltdown is to convert computation into mouse tracks on the microarchitecture state that can be read by an attacker so that you can leak information out. So let's take a look at this, this little example. The Spectre's uh, Meltdown is a little simpler. So in, in Meltdown, the, uh, the attacker is going to flush the caches, and then it's going to execute uh, some piece of code that throws an exception, you know, like address, bad address. And, and then what it's going to do is the microarchitecture doesn't handle, typically doesn't handle exceptions until retirement. So it's going to continue executing code. It's going to speculate past an instruction, speculating that it does not have an exception. And it's going to access a kernel value. This is a secret. And then it's going to pull one bit out of that secret. And it's going to touch memory based on the value of that bit. And then what we can do is we're going to load a cache line if the bit is zero and load another cache line if the bit is one. And then the exception is gonna happen, it's gonna recover the state of the machine, and then the attacker is gonna see, was this cache line loaded or was that cache line loaded? If this cache line loaded, that was a zero. If that cache line loaded, that was a one. Rinse and repeat until all the information out of your uh, application has been uh, stolen. And then Spectre builds on this technique by priming the BTB in the branch predictor to essentially execute any code you want in the uh, misspeculation path so that another application 
through misspeculation, through wrong path execution, we stitch together code in the misspeculation to grab a bit, convert that bit to an access to memory. When the system recovers, those cache lines are still loaded and we can pull that information out. It's a really hard attack to stop. Some of the defenses that have wrote, uh, arisen are compiler-based defenses that say don't speculate on this particular uh, secret, but that requires the programmers to specify the secrets. That requires trust that the attackers cannot get around those instructions. Um, it require uh, other things that are that are that are being proposed are cache partitioning so that the application that runs has a dedicated part of the cache that isn't accessible by a potential attacker. Now, what happens there is that you, even if it loads information into the cache based on those ones and zeros in, in this speculation, the attacker can't access that part of the cache. So that's a, that to me, in my mind, seems like a pretty good protection. Uh, Intel's CAT technology is in that class. Uh, MIT is a technology called DOG that they, they proposed. Um, removing precision timing from the system, that's a real bad technique because, you know, there's always, it's, if, if your goal is to stop people from measuring time, that's, that's not a good goal. Time is, uh, it's out there. We can do high precision measurements. We don't need your instructions to do it. Um, Non-speculative branches, that's an interesting technique. Uh, recovering microarchitecture state. When you have a misspeculation, oh my God, please don't do that. As a microarchitect, that would be nightmarish, but it could be a, it could be a potential solution. This is a really effective attack, and it's grown, grown, grown. Uh, it's come, people are coming at this in every possible direction, both uh, meltdown type attacks with with uh, uh, faults, and and then just straight BTB uh, priming attacks as well with Spectre type attacks. It's a really rich set of attacks. And I know if you're designing microarchitectures, you're probably really concerned about this type of attack. And then I want to share with you my favorite microarchitecture side channel attack. And the, the reason why I like this one is this one just, just really sort of underscores the, in my mind, the futility of trying to stop microarchitecture side channel attacks. It's just not possible. I think the end state for the microarchitecture community is yeah, we can't stop them. I know a lot of people think they can stop them. We're going to have talks in this forum to talk about how to stop them. But I'm already at the point where you can't stop them. And I'll talk about just because you can't stop microarchitecture attacks doesn't mean you can't have good defenses, good security. It just means I personally don't think you can stop microarchitecture attacks. But let's take a look at this one. And maybe you'll come to my side after you see this one. This is a, uh, this is a microarchitecture attack. Uh, it's a single bit leaking technique. And it's in the it's in the uh, power gating uh, mechanism on the AVX2 unit on, on the high-end Intel Xeons. And basically the way it works is on a high-end Xeon, if you haven't used 256-bit uh, AVX instruction, there's 128 and 256-bit AVX instruction. If you haven't done a 256-bit AVX computation, which is probably most computers in the world, in the last millisecond, it powers down the upper half of the AVX2 unit. Right, that's fine, that's cool. Power it down, save some energy. No more leakage there. Um, when it's powered down and you use an AVX256 instruction, it takes significantly longer to do that instruction because the first thing you gotta do is you gotta power up the power grid. And this is a side channel that you can use to communicate information on the network because it is, it is you know, it's hundreds of cycles of delay, to, you know, to get those power rails up to voltage before you can do that 256 bit. So the way you transmit a piece of information on a side channel is the uh, the victim, um, the attacker doesn't do any AVX 256 operations for one millisecond. And then it calls into the victim and it uses misspeculation or whatever technique to get the victim uh, to leak the secret zero bit by doing nothing and leak the one bit by doing an AVX256 operation. If it does an AVX256 operation, you'll see this high latency 600 cycles of powering up the grid in your request. If you don't see that high latency 600 cycles, then you know that the secret was a zero. It's a really effective technique. 
And how do you eliminate it? You can't have any power gating on the AVX2. It's really, it's going to be tough. You're going to get rid of the power gating on the AVX2 unit? That's, I mean, is the world going to spend, you know, you know, billions of joules of energy just because somebody might want to try and do this? It's, it's, it's a challenge to get rid of these side channels. Now let's take a look at physical side channels, which I would consider even harder to get rid of than timing side channels. Um, physical side channels are when you measure power, electromagnetics, voltage variations, and you infer information about the underlying system. The, the key idea here is we're going we're gonna to take a device. The device has got some secret in it. We're going to give it some inputs, and we're going to ask it to do an operation. We're going to control the inputs. What we don't know is the secret. And we're going to specifically measure power and electromagnetics around particular operations that involve my constant, C, and some secret information, K. There's, for example, in a AES engine, there's a point where you take my input and you XOR it with a bit in the key. Now, knowing my input and not knowing the key bit, if I can measure the power or the electromagnetics of this XOR, an XOR with a zero and an XOR with a one, if my bit is a zero, will result in two different power signatures based on how an XOR circuit works. If I can pull that information out, I've got access to that particular bit. I now know that bit. And then I can continue on in the algorithm to focus on other bits, knowing that piece of bit information. Because now I can condition my inputs knowing that this particular bit to get particular operations deeper into the bit computations. Now I can pull out linearly with a number of bits information about those secret keys. And instead I don't have to like guess 128 bit secret key, which is essentially impossible to brute force. You know, it's really easy to measure this information if I have access to the system and the analysis is pretty straightforward. So these are really powerful attacks. There's also forms of the attack called differential attacks, which even if you try to randomize stuff, if there's any commonality in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in how you randomize stuff, the information will leak through. It's really quite impressive. So here's a power attack on the square and multiply algorithm again, right? Remember with a with a zero bit, uh, we just do the square, and with a one bit, we do a multiply. So now we're looking at power variations as this algorithm runs, and we're seeing you know little spikes here when we have that additional multiply. And so now we can read the key bits: zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, zero. zero. So we're getting a lot of information out by just looking at that additional power draw from that multiplier. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about a key-based, excuse me, a fault-based attack. This is on RSA. And I'm not going to go into the details, of this, but I want to give you a, 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 a sense of how it works. And then we'll talk a little bit about what kind of faults could possibly manifest that would lead to this. Uh, but this, this particular set of attacks is on RSA, and it's trying to infer private key bits. Now, private key bits. Um, on RSA typically last, you know, they typically have a lifetime of two to four years. So these attacks can be perpetrated over many, many, many months. And then once you lose your private key, um, you can masquerade as a website or you can digitally sign things uh, that you, you know, to assert that you, something was coming from that entity if you still the private key. So let's take a look at what a digital signature is and how you could use these kind of attacks to uh, steal someone's dig digital signature key. Now, when you do a digital signature, you're going to take a piece of public information and you're going to pass it to an entity and you're going to ask them to sign it. And what they do is they essentially encrypt it with their secret key and pass it back to you. And then you decrypt that information with their public key. And if it's the same information you sent them, you know you're talking to the holder of the private key associated with the public key that you originally encrypted, sent the data to, that you just decrypted the data with. And so, you know, if it's the public key of your bank, you're talking to your bank, unless your bank locks your private key. 
With a fault-based attack, you're going to send that message again. And if there's a fault during a certain part of the computation of that circuit, they'll send you back a invalid signature. And what people have shown time and time again, that you can sort of work back through the computation to figure out where did the fault occur? And wherever that fault occurred, um, once they figure out that the fault occurred, they can get a correct signature back out. As part of that process, they have to guess typically four bits of the private key. And so by just guessing those four bits and where the fault was, you get the correct signature out. Now you've released four bits. Rinse and repeat and look for another four bits. Rinse and repeat. Look Again, linear with the number of bits in a key, 2,048 bits in a, in a private key for RSA today. Now you're able to extract silently this information. So what is the goal? The goal is no faults in your hardware, right? Yeah, that is the goal. The kind of faults that can lead to these vulnerabilities are things like over temp in a data center. Over temp in a data center and your multiply doesn't complete in one cycle. It's got one little fault in it. That multiply single bit fault will leak four bits of the key out if it's, if it's executing an RSA core algorithm. Or if there's any kind of voltage manipulation in the system, you know, there's a, there's a brownout due to some other accelerator causing, you know, some, and, and if the attacker can control that, for example, you, you can create intermittent faults, which can lead to leaking of this information. So these are very, very, very powerful side channel attacks that just basically steal the most important bits of the system. All right, we're getting into the end of it. So we've seen all those different kinds of side channels. Let's now take a look at some of the key takeaways. And then I wanna just spend a little bit of time talking about the directions I'm taking in my research and in my startup to try and defend against some of these attacks. So first key takeaway, side channels are everywhere, all through the stack. They're in the crypto, they're in the control, they're in the memory, they're in the microarchitecture, they're in physical devices. They're everywhere. And second takeaway is that performance optimate, optimized design leads, in a sense, to these side channels. By sharing re resources, optimizing the common case, providing fine grain timing access in a system, you're creating opportunities for the existence of side channels. So there's this, there is a definite tension between performance-oriented design and, and side channels. It's not, a, it's not a, a tension that we're subject to forever. It's one that we have to be aware of and we have to do performance-oriented design in a way that doesn't lead to side channels. Personally, I think the prevalence of side channels and the um, prevalence of people in our design teams that don't understand side channels, that um, if you want to build a design that's side channel resistance, you really need to lean into what I call durable defense mechanisms. And just as an example, I want to show you one of the sort of core defense mechanisms against cache side channels and then show you how non-durable it is. Okay. Probably the most, you know, the, the, the leading uh, defense for cache side channels, uh, where you know information is leading through a cache, are randomized caches. And the basic idea with a randomized cache is you're going to organize your cache in a way where the indexing of the cache is a cryptographic secret. All right, so there's a key that transforms the index to the, uh, the set index of the, of the bits to the location in the cache that's accessed. And that key can change from application to application. So it's a secret where my data is stored in the cache. This is a very powerful technique and it really stops the creation of what are called eviction sets. Here's the problem, completely not durable technology. Why? Because there's so little entropy in the crypto. The crypto is from eight bits to eight bits. It's from 10 bits to 10 bits. It is, it's baby crypto, it's baby crypto and people can just walk right through this crypto. 
Good crypto is 128 bits of crypto. This is not 120 bits of crypto. It's it's literally, you know, n bits where two to the n is number of sets in your cash. It's not very strong crypto. And so this is some work by my one of my PhD students, Teru Verma, where what we did is we we just uh, the attacker doesn't know how you randomize your cash. It doesn't know if you're re-randomizing your cash. So it uses communication techniques, repetition codes, and differential encoding to create a signature that it sprays into the cache. And then it does prime some sets probabilistically. And then we then go to uh, the receiver. We ask it to do something. And then it accesses the set, sets of the cache, probabilistically as well. We don't know where it accesses the sets. But in the end, we can detect with some probability whether or not the victim accessed a particular part of the, any part of the cache. Did they commit an action in the cache? Why? Because the cache is finite, because the entropy on the crypto is finite. This is true even if you're re-randomizing your cache. And then we recover that using differential probes and also our repetition codes recover the signal. And what we end up getting is the original bit that you put into the cache. We can pull that right straight out. We don't need any knowledge of how the cache maps. We don't know any knowledge of the cache replacement policy. We don't need any control over the set index bits. All we need to know is that the cache has limited entropy and there's going to be a finite probability that the sender is going to prime a set and that the receiver is going to destroy one of those prime sets, which will be a signal to the cache. And so here, we, here we're working on this. This is essentially uh, a randomized new cache, which is a very, very difficult cache to de-randomize. We don't de-randomize it. We just send data through probabilistically. And the green here is our zero bits, and the purple is our one bits. And so when we do discrimination analysis on those cycles, we can see it. signal is very strong for that cache, very strong. So what do you do? What do you do? Well, how do you how do you stop information from leaking out through your side channels? You gotta have durable mechanisms. And low entropy crypto is not durable. It's easily breakable. You need high entropy crypto. High entropy strong forms of cryptography applied to these systems. And you need isolation. These, in my mind, are really the only two mechanisms that are durable cryptography of the form high entropy large keys and isolation physical isolation physical isolation either of a temporal or spatial form and that in my mind could build stuff and then i just want to send one slide talking about what startups do in the startup agile labs building this platform called the ozone privacy platform and it is designed to stop all side channels as well as all software hacking vulnerabilities and it's a pretty simple idea the idea is to build a processing unit that operates directly on encrypted data so strongly encrypted data lying all around inside your cpu somebody hacks in all they get out is crypto data you want to operate on that data you apply operations, instructions directly on the encrypted data, and you get encrypted data as a result. What's interesting about this technology is the owner of the system may not have been the one that encrypted the data. In that case, you're actually providing a computational service with my own private algorithms on someone else's data, and I can't see their data. So you send me your encrypted genome, I run my proprietary algorithm to detect whether or not you have a particular disease propensity. I don't know what your disease propensities are, but I can send you that data back, you can decrypt it and see it. Pretty interesting technology. It's hard to break because it's just you know, straight strong crypto throughout the system. Got to eliminate all those side channels in that processing unit, which decrypts, does operations, but that is a single physically isolated unit. And we can eliminate the side channels by just building it without the side channels that we worry about in this entire presentation. And so when you send encrypted data in, you encrypt the data out, 
And uh, if someone acts in your system, they just get to seal ciphertext. If someone listens to the operation of this unit, there's no timing side channels. Uh, crypto, physical isolation, to me, seems like a pretty durable, durable set of mechanism. And it's the direction we're going. I'd love to tell you more about it if you're interested. So I've got a bibliography for the materials I uh, included today. And uh, thank you so much. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to present today. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be glad to talk to you more. Thank you so much. Good day.